Bibles to Genesis chapter 30, and as well, we're turning there. Sunday nights, we go through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, several weeks ago, I asked you to pray for a young man by the name of R.J. had been in a, a terrible accident, and uh, um, he's a miracle, and um, he'll be coming home from the hospital, Lord willing, this Tuesday, and back in school maybe in a couple of weeks. It is a total miracle. So thank you for your prayers. And uh, continue to pray uh, for him. But I wanted to give you that update. When we come to chapter 30 here of Genesis, uh, Jacob is now married to two women. And he has two wives. One more than he wanted. And uh, certainly one more than any man needs. Uh, and uh, this was not his doing. It was his father-in-law who kind of, you know... Uh, deceived him on the whole thing. And the uh, one wife, Leah, the other Rachel, they're both sisters, and that's the only thing that could make it worse. Uh, it's got all of the worst ingredients to it, but God's got the grace for these situations, and he's going to be unbelievable on how he's going to uh, turn this, this thing around and work it together for good, not only for them, but for, for all of, of, of the human population ever. So, Leah, the oldest that he married uh, first, uh, she is very, very fertile. And she has, in, in chapter 29, uh, given birth through Jacob to four sons already, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And uh, so now we continue the account uh, with that background, chapter 30, verse 1. Now, when Rachel, who is the other wife, <clears throat> saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister and said to Jacob, Give me children uh, or else I'm going to die or else I die. So uh, the motivation behind all of this is she has a desire to have children. And um, in those days, uh, with kind of a superstition about things, uh, children were viewed as a gift from the Lord, which is, is absolutely true. But that if a woman was infertile, could, could not conceive and bear a child, she was viewed as being maybe a sinner or under God's judgment or something like that. So it reflected poorly upon her and, and they took it personally in their relationship with God. Never do that. Never, ever, ever do that. Uh, come to a conclusion about God's love for us on the basis of some circumstance. Here's the basis of our knowledge for God's love for us. The cross of Calvary. God demonstrated his love toward us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for the ungodly. That never changes. Those circumstances change in, in life. Now, she is asking her husband, really demanding of him, that he give her a child. So she... He either esteems him very highly or her expectations are unrealistic. But she does so out of an envy for her sister. Her sister has born Jacob now uh, four sons, and, and so she demands out of that envy and uh, uh, wants uh, uh, children also. Envy in the heart of a wife is, uh, makes for a very, very miserable home. So uh, uh, here she is. She demands this of, of Jacob and makes the threat or else, you know, I'm, I'm going to die. Now, she's asking Jacob to do something that is not in his power to do. That's always going to create a problem in a marriage. Uh, when I demand of the other spouse what I can only ask of God in prayer and a husband is not God and a wife is not God in a marriage. And there are certain things that we can expect uh, from one another biblically, but we cannot expect the other person to be God in, a, in our lives and to give us what only God can give us, which Jacob's going to let her know about in just a moment. I think that women um, need to be especially careful in this particular area. This is, Jacob's going to get really upset over this. He's going to get angry in a way that he shouldn't, but... But it, but it happens when a wife does this kind of thing uh, to, to her husband. She is basically saying to him, if you don't give me children, then I'm going to be miserable in this marriage. And uh, uh, in a godly husband, uh, there is, we are commanded to nourish and to cherish our wives. We're commanded to love them and take care of them. And uh, that's a command that's given to a husband. 
And, and a husband that takes those commands seriously, the satisfaction of his wife that she would be contented is a tremendous reward to him. He wants her to be that way. He works hard for her to be that way. And if he gets the feeling that I'm doing everything I physically can uh, to bless you, to be a good husband to you, to provide for you, but you are always one impossible thing away from being happy in life, that can tweak a husband. Because he just looks at it and, and says, it's always got to be this thing or one more thing or a bigger and better this thing or I'm not going to be content. And what he can do is lose his temper as she does here, which we shouldn't do. Or worse, what a husband will do is say she will never be satisfied. He will give up in attempting to do that, not only in the areas that she's demanding, but in other areas and sometimes even distance from in the, in the marriage relationship. I think, wives, it's important to understand about uh, men in, in that they really do. It is a reward for them to finish a day, finish a week, finish a year and look back and say, I took good care of my wife. And for her to recognize that that's something that a lot of hard work went into is a joy, of course. But I mean, working to earn a living and all of these kinds of things and, and that sense that she is satisfied and appreciative is important to to a husband. But he gets very upset over this, and his anger was aroused. It's a threat. It's not just a demand, but it's a demand with a threat. And his anger was aroused against Rachel. Rachel's the one he loves. And he said, Am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? You're asking something of me that you can only ask of God here. God has, has done this. Now, uh, remember earlier Isaac and Rebekah, uh, Jacob's father and his mother, when she uh, was unable to conceive for 20 years and all, and, and, and that was troublesome to her, Isaac took the high road on it. He's the model, not Jacob here in this situation. And he, the Bible says, prayed for Rebecca and in her situation, and the Lord answered his prayer, and, and then she did conceive. Rachel is ultimately going to conceive in, in this story. So she, she takes this kind of rebuke now from, from her husband, and she comes up with another plan here uh, for having children. And so she said, here is my maid Bilhah, go into her, and she will bear a child on my knees, that I also may have children by her. Now, the uh, uh, legal custom of the day in those days is a wife could take her uh, maid servant, could present the maid servant to her husband in order that he would conceive with her. And then as the child would come forth from the maid servant at birth, the child would be delivered to the wife. And, uh, and then the husband would declare related to the child, you are my son, you are my daughter. And, and that child was then adopted and viewed as the actual child uh, of, of the wife. And, and so uh, she would claim the child for her own. And this is what uh, she's doing according to the custom uh, of the day. And so then she gave him Bilhah, uh, her maid as wife. Jacob went into her. Bilhah conceived bore a son, and then Rachel said, God has judged my case. He has also heard my voice, gave me a son, and therefore she called his name Dan. And all these uh, boys are going to be named after the circumstances, kind of unpleasant circumstances uh, surrounding this marriage and surrounding this family. The word Dan means judging. So she is basically saying, now this child proves that I'm not under God's judgment. That God is not angry with me, and that's the reason that I'm unable to bear children. It's very sad that that's kind of the conception uh, that, I, that she's, she's under there, but she names the child to say, I'm free from that, I'm not barren due to God's displeasure or any sin in my life. And Rachel's maid Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. And Rachel uh, said, with great wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister. Very sad, isn't it? I mean, this battle that's going on between the two sisters and, and it's manifesting itself in this fight to have the most uh, children in some way. So 
with great wrestling I have wrestled with my sister, and indeed I have prevailed. And so she called his name Naphtali, and Naphtali means wrestling. So uh, she's communicating the fact that there's a tremendous wrestling match going on uh, for dominance in the marriage and in the family, and, and the, the wrestling for power is being centered upon uh, having children. And then Leah, when she saw that she stopped bearing, she took Zilpha, her maid, so two can play this game, right? And gave her to Jacob, his wife, and Leah's maid Zilpha bore Jacob a son. And then uh, Leah said, a troop comes. And so she called his name Gad. And the word Gad or the name Gad, it means a troop. And it's very appropriate that she, she names this boy with military imagery. There is a war going on in that household. And uh, so she's already born the four sons, and, and then now here's another child through her, uh, uh, through her uh, maidservant. This makes five uh, up against the two that have born, been born through uh, Bilha, uh, the maidservant of, of Rachel. And so five against two, we've got a troop, and what do you think about that? My, it'd make you enough to take a second job. And Leah's maid, uh, maid Zilpha bore Jacob a second son. And then Leah said, I am happy for the daughters will call me blessed. And so she called his name Asher, which means happy, uh, speaking of her joy over the birth. Now Reuben, who is the oldest, he's the firstborn to Leah, probably about seven years old at this time. He went in the days of wheat harvest and he found mandrakes. Uh, in the field and what mandrakes were uh, they're kind of a fruit and uh, they were considered in ancient times to be an aid in fertility so you can imagine how much interest there was in this household uh, over something like that so uh, he finds these mandrakes he brings them to his mother Leah Rachel uh, hears about it in light of her, her physical condition. She comes to Leah, very polite at this point, please give me some of, some of your son's mandrake. She's looking for any hope for becoming pregnant. But Leah said to her, is it a small matter that you've taken away my husband? I mean, we're talking about years after this marriage and all. Uh, would you take away my son's mandrakes also? So there's a rebuke. And... Uh, we're going to read later that when Laban catches the father of these, catches up to Jacob and, and his wives as they're uh, leaving and heading back to Canaan, that everyone is living in their own tent, ultimately. <laughs> so uh, everybody's got a wing on the house it, 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 because it's, it's not the funnest place to live. And Rachel said to her, therefore, he, Jacob, will lie with you tonight. For your son's mandrakes, give me give me uh, Reuben's mandrakes that he found, and uh, and Jacob can sleep with you tonight. Uh, yeah, uh, kind of a weird thing. So he he. Uh, it's so weird. I've lost my train of thought here on this thing. <laughs> so she. So, so evidently, Jacob is spending most of his time with Rachel. And so she says, all right, I'll get him out of my tent and, and head it in your direction for these mandrakes. And so when Jacob comes after a hard day work, at work out in the field, comes out of the field in the evening, Leah was running out to greet him and said, you must come into me, for I have surely hired you. With, that's a nice way. I've hired you with my son's mand, mandrakes. Now, is it just me or does this seem just a little insane to you in terms of a household? I mean, it's just weird. God is so gracious. He's going to, man... And uh, he's going to take care of all of them. And, and they didn't, none, of the, none of these people asked for this. This is something that's been done uh, to them. And, uh, and so he lay with her that night. God listened to Leah. Leah uh, uh, is adding prayer to all of this. She conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. And Leah said, God has given me my wages because I have given my maid to my husband. And so she called his name Issachar, and Issachar means my hire. So, um, unusual name. Uh, somebody might say to Issachar later in life, hey, Issachar, I've never met an Issachar before. I mean, how'd you get that name? And, uh, 
he'd have to say, listen, you, you don't want to know how I, got, how I got that name. Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. So uh, Leah uh, is fully responsible for six of the twelve uh, patriarchs, the tribes, heads of the tribes of, of Israel, twelve tribes of Israel. She bears him a sixth son. Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. And so she called his name Zebulun, which means dwelling. So again, he seems to be spending most nights with Rachel. And, and she is hoping that this sixth son will cause a, a change in his heart. And she will, he will begin uh, to spend more time with her. And afterwards, uh, she bore, afterwards, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. And we need to know that. Dinah is a daughter of Leah. A couple of chapters that will be important for us to understand. And then God remembered Rachel. God listened to her. So Rachel is praying in all of this now. And he opens up her womb. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So this is, she's saying, now this is just makes it clear to everyone that God isn't mad at me. Isn't it terrible to live life like uh, uh, because of, of this and, uh, and, and think God is mad at me because of this circumstance? It has nothing to do with that at all. I hope none of us are thinking God is mad at us over some physical circumstance tonight that's completely in God's control and not ours. And, and so she, she finally has a, a burden lifted from her that is self-imposed. God has never put it on, on her. And so she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord will add to me uh, another son. And so Joseph means adding, he shall add. And so uh, she is, uh, names Joseph with the name, uh, that his name becomes a prayer that God will then add another son after Joseph, that God isn't done giving her sons, that, that she'll be able to have uh, other sons as well. Now, this the, one of the reasons for this whole section of Scripture is to give us insight into a um, kind of a halfway miserable. I'm sure it's, it, it has its joyous aspects to it, too, but a halfway miserable situation that has been produced by, uh, you know, the decision making and the manipulation of a father and a father in law that, that they're in, in the middle of. But it, it, uh, in, in, in the kind of situation God is going to overrule in all of their lives and really make it a blessing to them, and as I said, the whole world. But it helps us to understand the origin of the twelve tribes of, of Israel. There's going to be another son born uh, to Rachel a little bit later. His name's going to be Benjamin. That will complete the twelve. And so you wonder, where did the twelve tribes of Israel uh, uh, come from? And it, Jacob's name is later going to be changed to Israel. When we talk about the 12 tribes of Israel, we're talking about the 12 tribes of the land of Israel, the Jews. But we're also talking about the 12 sons of Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. And here's who they were born to and how they came uh, into existence. And God said, uh, and it came to pass, rather, verse 25. When Rachel had born Joseph, that Jacob said to Laban, his father-in-law, please send me away that I may go to my own place and to my own country. Uh, he has uh, been serving his father-in-law for at least 14 years. He wants to go back to Canaan, and he asks for his father-in-law's uh, permission, but more he's asking that he would be sent off with his father-in-law's blessing. And that, that's what he's asking for. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you, and let me go, for you know both my service, which I have done for you. It's been a, a fair and square. It's been good. It's been great for you. It's been great for me, but it's time for me to go home. And Laban said to him, Please stay. If I have found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. So here is... Laban, very, very smart man. He is just a terrible human being, but he's very, very smart. And he realizes that he has in his son-in-law not only a hard worker, not only a very, very conscientious uh, man, but he has, a ma he has a son-in-law who on top of all of that is enjoying God's supernatural blessing upon his life. And so he doesn't want to let this guy go. So notice what he does. This is what you want to hear from your boss. 
Verse 28, name me your wages and I'll give it, give it. Now that's, that's going into a negotiation pretty weak, wouldn't you say? Nobody comes in their opening sentence, name your wages, I'll give it to you. And, and, but that's what he does. That's how valuable his son-in-law Jacob is uh, to him in, in, this, uh, in this situation. Clearly, he does not want to lose uh, this man. So Jacob said to him, you know how I have served you. And how your livestock has been with me. I've looked after all of your flocks. For what you had before I came was little, and it is increased to a great amount. And the Lord has blessed you since my coming. And now, when shall I provide for my own house? I've worked hard for you for 14 years. Your flocks have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. But you've never given me my own stake to start to uh, raise my own uh, 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 family and family wealth and all. He's, he's married the two daughters, but uh, Laban has other sons. When Laban dies, the bulk of the wealth is going to go to the oldest son. Jacob's just looking at things and saying, listen, I'm not getting any younger. I've got to have something that takes care of my own family. I can't be dependent uh, upon you. And so um, it's not a matter of wages. And so uh, Laban said to him, what shall I give you? And Jacob responds now to the offer. And he said, you shall not give me anything. Uh, Jacob doesn't want to ever be known. It's, it's part of a very beautiful character in him. He doesn't want to be known as being made by anybody else. He wants his life to be a product of who he is, what he is, his hard work, these kinds of things. I'm not asking you to give me anything, Laban. He said... I do. I will do this. Uh, if you will do this one thing for me, I will again fle- feed and keep your flocks. Let me pass through all of your flock today, removing from there all of the speckled and spotted sheep and all of the brown ones among the lambs and the spotted and speckled among the goats. These shall be my wages. And so my righteousness will answer for me in time to come when the subject of my wages comes before you. Every one that is not spotted and and speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the lambs will be considered stolen if it is with me. And so this is what he proposes, kind of is is the agreement on, on things. He proposes, I'm going to go through your entire flock that you've got here. And uh, all of the solid goats uh, in color, all of the solid sheep in color, those are all yours. Now, in the goats and the sheep in, in, in the Middle Ages, in, in the Middle East there, that a solid color is the dominant gene. Uh, the spotted and the speckled is the recessive gene. So he says, I'm going to go through here. I'm going to take all the spotted ones, all the streaked ones, all the two tones. I'm going to put them over here on one side, which is a, a comparatively small number. And I'm going to take all of the solids and put them over here. The solids are yours, Laban. The spotted and the speckles, they're mine. And I'll start my flock and, and, and start my stake here with this particular group. And we'll always know if um, I've stolen from you, because if you ever find a solid colored animal in my flock, then I've taken it from you. It was a very easy way to, to watch over the two flocks and to, and to keep them uh, divided. So this is the, the agreement that, that has been made uh, on, on things. And uh, again, since the, the full color was the dominant gene, the streaked was the, the recessive gene. So the odds of this flock now that's separated in solid colors of ever producing streaked animals and spotted animals, very, very, very low. So Laban looks at this particular situation and uh, he can't believe what he's being offered as, as a deal here. And, uh, and so he says, oh, that it were according to your word. Uh, he, he, does, he doesn't even try to play it cool on the thing. He says, I can't believe, in essence, the offer that you're making here. Uh, sold. <laughs> tap, tap, no erases. Uh, whatever, you know, kind of a deal. He's, he, he wants this thing. Now, the beautiful thing about Jacob in all of this is he, he keeps stumbling over the fact that he's a manipulator. 
And he's a self-made man, and he's a very, very talented man. He's a very strong man, and, uh, and all these things. He keeps tripping over his attempt to manipulate situations rather than to trust in God. But there, there are good things that are in there while God is refining his life. He has absolute confidence that he can take and load this deal all the way in Laban's favor. And God is going to bless him. God is going to bless him in this situation. And it represents beautiful faith on, on his part. Now, while we're uh, talking about uh, Jacob and, and his manipulative uh, tendency, this is Jacob at his Jacobiest right here. Verse 37. I'm sorry. Uh, Let's start at verse 35, uh, since we're going all the way through the Bible. So he removed that day the male goats, Laban did, that were speckled and spotted, all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had some white in it, all the brown ones among the lambs, and gave them into the hand of his sons. And then he put three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. Now, this is dirty, dirty, dirty. That guy is so dirty, Laban is. So here's the deal that Jacob proposes. You get all the solids. You have the majority, overwhelming majority of the flock. I will take the smaller group that is spotted and, and, and speckled and, and streaked and all, and we'll put them over here. This is my stake for, for getting rolling on things, and, and this is yours. Oh. That it could be so, you know, and he makes the agreement. Then what he does is he turns around immediately and he holds on to the solids as belonging to him. Then he takes the speckled and the spotted that they just agreed belongs to Jacob, takes them back from Jacob, gives them to his son and separates them from a three day journey away from um the rest of the flock. And now what he's making Jacob do is start his flock with any speckled or any spotted that will come out of an all brown, all black, all white flock. Jacob's going to complain later that you changed my wages ten times over the years. And this is the first place that he does it. I mean, he, they don't even finish the conversation. Before he he comes in and twists the the whole uh, deal here, but what what J, what Laban does not realize is he is not up against Jacob in this. He is up against God Almighty, and he is going to lose that whole flock or what comes from that flock uh, to to Jacob. And uh, so here here Laban Laban knows what he's doing. Okay, boys, take the flock. That's yours. He knows he's just you know, uh, stab Jacob on, on the thing and, uh, and everything. And he realizes Jacob is in a place to say, well, wait a second, that's not the thing. He's respectful on things and, and to make a complaint there. And so Jacob's no match for Laban at this point. But what Laban doesn't realize is he's no match for God. And God's going to relieve him of, of his wealth because of the way that he treats people and because of the way he treats Jacob here in, in this situation. So he takes, that, he takes that flock and moves them all the way three days' journey. I mean, don't you think like an eight-hour journey would have been enough? Or one day? He moves them three days' journey between one flock and the other. You know why? Because when you're dishonest and you, don't, and you know you're not trustworthy, then you assume everyone else is just as dishonest as you are. He moves at three days distance because that's the kind of distance you'd have to give between the two flocks if, if that flock belonged to Laban to keep it safe. But this is the way uh, that, he, that he is. And so here now in verse 37, Jacob's beginning with less than nothing almost now. And so he takes for himself rods of green poplar. And of the almond and chestnut trees, he peels white strips in them. So he takes the bark and he's peeling like, uh, leaves part of the bark on and he peels it off so the white underneath the bark shows. And then he turns a little bit and he peels and so you got these stripes, all these. And then these rods are thrown in, into the water and, uh, and expose the white which was on the rods. And the rods which he had peeled, he set before the flocks in the gutters, in the watering troughs, uh, where the flocks came to drink so that they should conceive when they came uh, to drink. 
And so the flocks conceived before the rods, and the rods brought, and, and the flocks brought forth streaked, speckled, and uh, spotted. So he's doing it out of this uh, kind of an old wives' tale uh, superstition uh, uh, thing, where in his mind, if the animals will mate with one another while, around the troughs while they're looking at streaked uh, sticks and that kind of thing, then whatever they're seeing while they're mating is then going to be imposed upon uh, the animals. And uh, so this is the kind of thing that he that he's uh, uh, doing on on things. Now he's going to be very very successful. A lot of streaked and spotted animals are going to come out of all this, but it has nothing to do with his attempt at manipulation here. And you ought to put right there in your margin there by verse 39. You write down Genesis 31, uh, verse 7, because later on he is going to come to realize. Uh, and so God has taken away the livestock of your father and given it to me. He's going to recognize that God did this. I was doing all that streets stuff. You ever done something stupid when you're young? And uh, the whole thing, and boy, didn't we pull that off? And then you realize later God was just rolling his eyes and blessing us anyway uh, in, in the middle of it. But he makes sure we find out sooner or later that it was him. And so then Jacob separated. Now we get into some actual science. And uh, Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face uh, toward the street and all the brown in the flock of Laban. But he put his own flocks by themselves and did not put them with Laban's flock. And it came to pass whenever the stronger livestock conceived that Jacob placed the rods before the eyes of the livestock in the gutters that they might conceive uh, among uh, the rods. But when the flocks were feeble, he did not put them in. And so the feebler were Laban's and the stronger were Jacob's. And so he still got a little bit of uh, magic he's trying to do here in the thing. But one thing he is starting to use is some uh, some natural selection. So he's taking his flock, the spotted and the streaked and all, and uh, that are being born. And they're being born because God is having them born that way, as God's going to reveal to him a little bit later. But he takes them and he puts his flock over here, very, very small flock and all. But he sees, OK, here is a strong male, strong female. And he takes the strong and he's mating the strong. He is uh, in, in, he's involved in natural selection and that kind of thing with his flock. So he's really working his flock for, uh, you know, and not having the strong with the feeble and the mating and and all that so he's doing all that over here Laban's flock over here let him just mate and uh, strong with weak weak with weak and whatever and whatever happens and he's just letting that thing uh, you know be be whatever uh, whatever it's going uh, to be and thus the man became prosperous and exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks male and female servants and uh, camels and donkeys. And so uh, this is God is just blessing him uh, like crazy. Now, as I kind of mentioned a little bit last week, but it's an important point related to this this whole season in in their life. Jacob, Leah and Rachel have been dealt a very, very bad hand by by Laban. I mean, he has just done them wrong every Every way that he, he knows how to do them wrong. But God is overruling all of it. Every step of the way. Every step of the way, God just pours his favor out on their three lives. He has watched what has happened to them. He knows what's going on and all. And he just keeps pouring blessings out on their life personally to say nothing of what they don't even know yet and that is that they have produced uh, uh, 11 so far of the 12 that are going to be the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel and impact all of human history through them and and it's very important because this is an unfair world this is a very fallen world that we live in and a lot of things can be pushed our way through a lot of different kinds of people in the course of our lives and wrong can be done bad can be done like Laban has has done to them and but in the midst of it as a child of God it's so important that at some point in the midst of God's blessing that a light goes on and I recognize the blessings that are coming into my life from God too 
Because the tendency can be to always look at Laban and tell Laban stories for the rest of our lives and this and that and this is why I never and couldn't and all and, and, and everything like that. But the need is to look and say, yeah, he was all of that and more. But look at what God has done in our lives. Look at the life we're living. Look at the blessings that are here. Look how he's been faithful to us, how he's looked out for us every step of the way. And it's easy to miss that side of things because of what Laban's done to us. But don't miss it because God is blessing us. God's fingerprints are all over our lives. But we've got to take the time uh, to notice them, too. Chapter 31. And then, now Jacob heard the words of Laban's sons, saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's. And uh, and from what was our father's, he has acquired all this wealth. So God is doing a wealth transfer on this thing. Laban's flock is getting smaller and smaller. Jacob's flock is becoming gigantic and all. And then the sons, who were probably born to Laban after Leah and Jacob, they look at it and it looks like this brother-in-law over here is stealing all the family wealth. He's stealing the inheritance and all. So they accuse him. They say, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's. That's a lie. Jacob didn't take anything away. God was taking away Laban's wealth and transferring it. You you cannot be an evil person. You cannot be a wicked person and hold on to wealth indefinitely in this world. Uh, I mean, the book of Proverbs is full of Proverbs that talk about wealth is going to transfer when it's in the hands of the wicked because the wicked don't know how to hold on to it. And, And that doesn't even speak of what God will do to interject himself into the situation. So... There's a jealousy here, and, and, and things are starting to get hostile toward uh, Jacob, even though he's completely operating above board. And Jacob saw the countenance of Laban, his face, and, and uh, representing his attitude toward him, and indeed it was not favorable toward him as before. So, uh, you know, Laban, uh, when he would look at Jacob, uh, I mean, his face is strained. The relationship is strained. Jacob looks at it and says, this is starting to get a little bit dangerous. And then the Lord said to Jacob, isn't it great to hear the voice of the Lord just at that time <laughs> and have his direction? And the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your family and I'll be with you. Remember, he wanted to leave um, uh, six years earlier, but he, he stayed on for six years, gained this gigantic flock and wealth and all of these kinds of things. He wanted to leave with Laban's blessing six years earlier, and he stayed on for six years. God blessed him, but now God steps in and says, what you wanted to do six years ago, now I'm commanding you to do now. And you look at that there in, in verse 3. It's a command, but it's a command with prom- uh, a promise. Return to the land of your fathers and to your family. Go back to Canaan, and then here's the promise. I'll be with you. And I'll be with you translates your success is guaranteed. You're going to end up in the land of, of Canaan. You're going to get there if you obey me. And so Jacob sent, and he called Rachel and Leah to the field, to the flock, as he's out there, and he said to them, I see your father's face, and, uh, that it is not favorable toward me as before. But the God of my father has been with me. And you know that with all my might I have served your father. He's been a hard worker for 20 years. And yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But God wouldn't let him get away with it. That's what he says here. But God did not allow him to hurt me. For if he said thus, the speckled shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore speckled. And if he said thus, the streaked shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore streaked. And then notice it. So God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. He recognizes, you know, that it wasn't this streaked uh, branches in the water trough. This is something that God has done. And it happened at the time when the flocks conceived that I lifted up my eyes and I saw in a dream and, and behold, the rams which leaped upon the flocks mating were streaked, speckled and gray spotted. So how does the light go on for Jacob for him to realize that this isn't his manipulation and his put the rods in the trough and that whole kind of thing? God gives him a vision. 
And the vision that God gives him is that these solid color animals are mating with one another, but in the, or in the dream, he looks at them, and even though in the physical realm they're solid color, he allows Jacob to see what God is really making them in terms of the genetics and the whole thing that's happening inside of their that God was supernaturally intervening so that the, the fruit of that mating of the solids would be like two streaked were mating. That's just what he just stepped in and just took the thing over on it. Now, what can Laban do about that? But, but that's, where, that's where God got through to Jacob and said, this is why the, the, thing, the wealth has transferred over to you and why you're blessed. My intervention, not yours. And the angel, then the angel of God spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob. And I said, Here I am. And he said, Lift up your eyes now and see all um, the uh, rams which leap on the flocks are streaked and speckled and gray spotted, for I have seen all that Laban uh, is doing to you. Not for you, uh, but to you. I've seen it all, and I'm, I'm taking care of it. I'm defending you. I am the God of Bethel where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land and return to the land of your family. And he comes to Jacob and it's beautiful. He comes to Jacob as the God of Bethel. And it was in Bethel when Jacob was fleeing home because he saw it was going to kill him, wanted to 20 years earlier. God came to him and met with him in Bethel. God doesn't come to Jacob at this point. I am the God of Abraham and Isaac, your fathers. He said, I am the God of Bethel. I'm the God that met with you 20 years ago and began a personal relationship with you 20 years ago. And now I am going to continue to develop that personal relationship with you. So he's coming to him as, as a personal uh, God kind of thing. Now listen to me. I, I made a promise to you there. You're going to be a blessing to the whole world. Your descendants are going to be innumerable. All of this kind of thing. We've done the flock deal. Got you your family. Got the 12 patriarchs. At least 11 out of the 12. We're rolling on that. Now it's time to move on with the rest of my plan for, for your life. And so let's go ahead and clear out. And then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, as he told him the story and, and the, the proposal to leave, said, is there any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? Why should we stay? Uh, are we not uh, considered strangers by him? For he has sold us and also completely consumed our money. They recognize that he's been abusive and he's, uh, done a set, he's essentially been a thief in taking uh, any and all wealth to himself. Uh, at the, at the uh, expense not only of, uh, attempted to anyway, at the expense of Jacob, but also of his two daughters and grandchildren. For all these riches which God has taken from our father are really ours and our father's. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do it. That's about the best counsel you can ever <laughs> give anyone in the whole world, huh? But it is especially valuable when a godly man or one that's trying to be and trying to obey God in a very difficult circumstance making a very major decision in the family hears it from his wife whatever God has told you to do you go ahead and you do that those are the things that men think about on their deathbed when they count up their blessings in terms of, of who God has given them uh, in a wife and so beautiful there as they encourage him in the will of God. And then Jacob rose and set his sons and his wives on camels. And he carried away all his livestock and all his possessions which he had gained. His acquired livestock which he had gained in Padan uh, Aram to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. Now Laban had gone to shear uh, his sheep. So he's away while uh, Jacob is kind of uh, leaving. And uh, Jacob... <laughs> He's still being a sneak, uh, so, but he's growing. He's going to get there, but uh, he obviously doesn't like confrontation. He's, he's sharp. He's strong. He's, he's 
just an amazing guy in so many ways, but he clearly does not like conflict and uh, dealing with certain things face to face. And so uh, he he's going to take off while Laban's away. And Rachel had stolen as they were as they were leaving. Now, Rachel has had stolen the household idols that were her father's. So she steals the family gods on things. Now, I I don't per personally believe that Rachel stole the family gods or the family idols um, because she had a desire to worship those idols or those gods. Uh, I think that uh, in, in those days the family idols or the family gods would be passed on to the oldest son as a part of him having spiritual oversight of the family. Even in pagan tradition it was there. So I think that personally she took those idols as kind of a claim that in later days if her father died and died with tremendous wealth and the inheritance was going to be divided up that she could then produce those idols as a claim that her and Leah ought to uh, receive the same amount. It's theft, it's wrong, and, and she shouldn't do it. And uh, clearly at this point, this is not a deeply spiritual uh, family. But I don't get the sense that, uh, that, that she was actively worshiping these, these gods. And Jacob stole away, unknown to Laban the Syrian, and that he did not tell him that he intended uh, to flee. And so he fled. Any of you like that? I hate conflict. I just hate it. And uh, I'll do it. I have to do it in, in times. And, uh, but I dislike it very much. I do like to just slip off into the night. And so I understand this exactly. I've had to learn to talk to people face to face about uh, issues. So he stole away and uh, did not tell him that he intended to flee. And so he fled with all that he had. He arose and crossed the river and headed toward the mountains of Gilead. And Laban was told on the third day. So they've been traveling away for three days. Jacob now finds out, Laban does, that Jacob has fled. So now he's got to catch up. Jacob's got a three-day head start on him. But where is Laban? Laban may be three days uh, you know, journey away with the other flock, his flock now uh, tending it and everything. So, so he, he gets news of this. And then he took his brethren with him, pursued Jacob for seven days' journey, overtook him in the mountains of Gilead. But God uh, had come to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night. Uh, and it seems like just the night before he gets to, to Jacob. And God said to him this, be careful that you do not speak to Jacob, neither good nor bad. Not only do you not raise any physical violence against him, not only do you not do anything to him, I don't even want you to look cross-eyed at him. I don't want you to talk cross-eyed at him. I want you on your best behavior uh, when, when you uh, catch up. Uh, to him. And so Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mountains, and Laban, with his brethren, pitched in the mountains of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, What have you done that you've stolen away unknown to me and carried away my daughters like captives, you know, taken with the sword, you know? So why did, why did you leave without letting me kiss my daughters goodbye, kiss the little grandchildren and everything like that? And so he, he is... What do you say about a guy like this? I mean, it's the old, it's the old phony hurt father routine. I mean, the whole pull out every guilt trick in the bag kind of a deal and everything. He's just upset that all of his wealth has walked away. He didn't want to kiss anybody goodbye. And, and, and he, in fact, he had come to do them harm. And uh, as we're going to, uh, and that's why God warned them not to do harm. He did. He said, "Oh, good, I caught up with you. It was worth every bit of the seven days to get the little kisses that I needed and to bless you as you head off." God said, "Yeah, I know what you're up to, Buckaroo, and you better not do anything to him." And that's that's the deal. But he's going to lay this whole schmooze thing on and and the guilt trip and everything. Uh, on on the family you've carried away. Why do you flee away secretly? Why do I flee away secretly? Because you're Laban. 
You, that's why. And for 20 years you've been nothing but Laban. And steal away from me and not tell me. For I might have sent you away with joy in songs, with timbrels and harp and a knife in your back. And, and, <laughs> and you didn't allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. And now you've done foolishly in doing so. It is in my power to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, Beware that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. And uh, now you have surely uh, gone because you greatly long for your father's house. But then then he uh, uh, declares his final accusation. But why did you steal my gods? That's sad when you can have your gods stolen. And what does, he want? what does he want with these gods? His gods couldn't keep God, Jehovah God, from transferring all of his wealth from Laban over to Jacob. And all. They've been powerless for 20 years to do anything, but here he, his, his gods have, have been stolen. You know, it, 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 it is silly to worship a god if, if that god can't keep itself from being stolen. That's just illogical, isn't it? Well, that's what he's doing. You, if if you got to take care of your God, you've got the wrong God. You've got to have a God that's going to take care of us. But this is what he has. You stole my gods, you dirty rat. And so then Jacob answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid, uh, for I said, Perhaps you will take your daughters uh, from me by force. That's why I fled in the night. But uh, he addresses the first accusation. And then the second accusation about being a thief. Now remember, in that day... And in a Middle Eastern culture, to accuse someone of being a thief, wow. Okay, those are fighting words to the death kind of words. So this is a very strong accusation. And he said, with whomever you find your gods, do not let him live. And obviously, Jacob, uh, 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 as, as we see here in a moment, well, let's, let's just read it then. In the presence of our brethren, identify whatever we've taken that's of yours. Take it with you. And what Jacob didn't know is that Rachel had stolen the gods. So Laban went into whose tent first? Where does he expect to find it? The Jacob's tent, didn't he? Then he went into Leah's tent because she's probably the second most upset with him over that whole wedding thing. Boy, talk about holding a grudge. And, uh, and then into the two maids' tents, but he didn't find them. And then he went out of Leah's tent. And the last place he expected to find it was in Rachel's tent, and that's where he went. And Rachel had taken the household idols, put them in the uh, camel's saddle, and she's sitting on the camel with the gods underneath the camel's saddle, underneath them. And Laban searched all around the tent, all around her, until finally there's nothing left to search. But the saddle and what would be under it, she said to her father, Let it not displease my lord. I cannot rise before you, for the manner of woman is with me. I'm, I'm in my sight here and uh, can't get up and uh, no father's going to go very far uh, on on that argument and so he had searched everything else but that and he did not find the household idols and then Jacob now he's really upset and Jacob was angry and he rebuked Laban over accusing him of being a thief and Jacob answered and said to him where's my trespass where's my sin that you have so hotly pursued me Although you have searched all my things, what part of your household things have you found? See it uh, uh, here before my brethren and your brethren. Uh, Set it here before my brethren and your brethren that they may judge between us both. And then now he starts to roll. He's going to pour out 20 years of, of, of upset over how he's been treated. These 20 years... I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried. I know I was an expert shepherd. I never drove them so hard that they miscarried. And, and I have not eaten the rams of your flock when it was dinner time. We ate my flock and not yours for 20 years. That's amazing. That was due. You, you could eat from that, that other flock. And that which was born, uh, torn by beasts... I didn't bring to you. I bore the loss of it myself. You required it from my hand, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Now, later under the law of Moses, uh, if something was eaten, stolen or something was eaten uh, legitimately by a wild beast of a flock that you were overseeing uh, legally in the eyes of God, you didn't have to restore that animal because nobody can keep those things from happening. 
But here is Jacob. Whenever it did happen, he bore the loss. He replaced it with one from his own flock. And there I was in the day the drought consumed me and the frost by night and my sleep departed from my eyes. I've served you through every hardship. And thus I have been in your house every day for 20 years. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages ten times. And unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. And Laban answered and said to Jacob, These daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children. This flock is my flock. All that you see is, is mine. I mean, he's not, he would not have let these people go if God had not uh, warned him in, in all of this. He is still claiming that it belongs to him. But what can I do this day? Uh, to these my daughters or to their children whom they have borne. And now therefore come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. And so Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. And Jacob said to his brethren, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap, and they ate there on the heap. And Laban called this heap uh, Jagar uh, Shadutha, uh, which is Aramaic for a heap of witness. Uh, Jacob doesn't call it in the Aramaic. He speaks in Hebrew and calls it a galid, which means the same thing, a heap of witness. And Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me this day. And therefore, its name is called galid. Also, Mizpah, because, you, because he said, may the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent from one another. So if you've ever been to a jewelry store and they have those Mizpah rings where they kind of have like a design and then they cut it kind of in half and then the, the girl gets this one and the boy gets this one and they have the Mizpah ne necklaces and you put them together and it's one and then you take them apart and then they both go on their way and there's that sense that I'm incomplete until I see him again or her again and that kind of thing. And the, and the idea of Mizpah, the covenant that's made here biblically, the idea is may God watch over you while we're apart. And so the idea is here, honey, here's this necklace and everything. And may the Lord watch over you while we're apart. In a technical sense, biblically, this is a very suspicious, distrustful thing. What Jacob uh, Laban is saying is you are such a dirty, untrustworthy, stinking rat. May the Lord watch over you when I can't watch over you. That you don't come and take advantage of me. And I mean, that was the feeling back and forth. Now, don't get rid of your Mizpah rings or necklaces or anything, but you ought to know, uh, you know, uh, that much about it. So there's uh, you can't be trusted. And so God keep a watch on you because you're trouble for everybody kind of a deal. If you afflict my daughters or if you take a, an other wives besides my daughters, although no man is with us. See, God is a witness between you and me. And then Laban said to Jacob, here is this heap and here is this pillar which I have placed between you and me. This heap is a witness and this pillar is a witness that I will not pass beyond this heap to you and you will not pass beyond this heap and this pillar for, to me to do harm. And so it set a boundary between them. We can't cross into one another's territory to ever do one another harm. And the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor and the God of their father judge between us. Laban said, and Jacob swore not in the name of those, but he swore in the covenant by the fear of his father Isaac. And that's a reference to Jehovah. And then Jacob offered a sacrifice now to seal the covenant. He called his brethren to eat bread. They celebrated it with a meal and they ate bread and they stayed all night on the mountain. And early in the morning, Laban arose and he got that kiss that he wanted. He kissed his sons and daughters uh, talking about his grandchildren and all too. And he blessed them. He pronounced his blessing upon them. You notice who he didn't kiss and bless. No kissing and no blessing for Jacob. <laughs> it's a little strained. And then Laban departed and he returned to his place. All right. If the men will come forward.